Hi everyone, I'm uh, Chris Grilly. I'm an individual radiologist at uh, Christiana Hospital in Newark, Delaware. Uh, I'm gonna present a little uh, embold data to everyone, some new animal lab data that we have collected, a comparative study. Um, so if, as you guys collect, if you have any questions, wave your hand, stop me, this is very informal. Uh, here's a quick disclaimer from Boston Scientific and my disclosures. Um, okay, so those who haven't used Embold uh, yet, the whole idea behind Embold is simplicity. Um, Embold is not like the old interlocks. This is a fully detachable coil. It does have fibers in its original form. However, uh, part of the coil is unfibered, as you can see there, and that's to increase deliverability. But the part of the simplicity comes into play is that this coil can be used in any microcatheter. Standard, high flow, as small as the TrueSelect 1.9 French. It works in any microcatheter, so you don't have to think about that. And as somebody who's always in a rush and kinks the pusher wire on all my, on my coils all the time, uh, you don't have to think about that with this because the pusher wire on this coil is nitinol. So I still bend it and kink it all the time, but of course it strings back to shape, which is nice and gives a more reliable delivery. And of course, versus other detachable coils, this one does not need a handle. Uh, so you don't need any extra equipment opened up or like my hospital every now and then we run out of the handles but pull the coil and then we're surprised we don't have to worry about that with this and if you haven't used the embold coil there are trials or there are trial samples around here you just snap the back pull the rip cord and the coil deploys so it's very simple uh, here's the array of the embold coils the original coil is fiber partially as I previously discussed and you see that on the left there, but there's also a complete um, package of uh, embold coils, meaning we have packing coils as well, coming in long lengths without shape for aneurysms, aneurysms as such. And then also soft coils, which don't have any fibers, which are good for very, very small distal occlusions. So that's a little intro on the embold, but really the reason I'm here is to present some preclinical data uh, from a pig animal lab study and where we compared uh, involved fibered and soft against Ruby standard and soft and concerto coils. So here's the study design. We were mainly looking at the number of coils needed to achieve complete occlusion in a representative pig vessel, contralateral aside for our comparisons. And we did three comparison groups. The smallest vessel was a two to two and a half to three millimeter, where we compared the concerto against an embold soft, both four millimeters. Uh, the second group we compared Ruby Soft against Embold Soft, a little larger vessel, four to five and six millimeter coils. And then the final group was the largest vessel where we compared Ruby Standard, uh, which of course is a coil that requires a high flow catheter against the Embold Fiber coils. And those were six millimeter coils and about a five millimeter vessel. So I said our primary endpoint was number of coils, but also we looked at time to occlusion, coil length and planted, procedure time, fluoroscopy time and packing density. So those were secondary endpoints. And the study was really simple. All we did is had a pig model, mapped out the vessels, found the appropriate size, uh, deployed a coil, assessed the flow rate utilizing a Timmy spur, which I'll show on the next slide, uh, waited a minute. If the flow wasn't completely stopped, we put another coil, waited a minute, put another coil, waited a minute until there was complete occlusion. And this is the uh, flow scale that we used. It's modified from cardiology literature. Pretty much all you need to know is everything above grade zero there's still flow in the vessel, so we kept going, obviously with different gradations. And here's some examples of what it looked like what we were doing. So here's an example of a right internal iliac artery versus left, uh, in bold fibered on the right, and a ruby standard on the left, five coils placed on the left to achieve occlusion, three coils on the right. These are just pictures, I'll go into the actual data later, but just so you see what we were doing. Again, here we are in the internal femoral artery. Again, five coils versus three coils. This is the larger vessel room. As we get smaller into the uh, smaller vessel room, ruby soft against them both soft, we have uh, renal arteries here, three coils versus four coils. Now, as you see, some of you are gonna be jumping out at this because the ruby soft we use is six by 30. The embold soft we use is six by 60. So different coil size. We just picked the largest coil matrix for that particular size as the comparison. So we want it to be real world data. You have a big vessel, you want to include it, you pull the real, the largest side you had at that coil and use it to occlude. But to account for that, we do look at coil length and plant it a little later in the data. So that does cover that uh, discrepancy. Uh, here's the same thing in the internal maxillary artery. And then finally, the uh, comparison between the concerto helix 
and the Embold Soft, and these are in smaller vessels. As you can see, the coil packs drown and look similar. Um, most of these comparisons, they're about the same shape, shape, same density, but we actually have real data on that. And here's a right internal maxillary, left internal maxillary, four concertos versus one in bold. So here's the data. So number of coils to include. Uh, the left graph there is the in bold soft versus ruby soft and concerto. Uh, when looking at concerto versus bold soft, you have about four coils to one. Uh, ruby soft versus in bold soft, a similar story, 4.7 coils to two. And then the larger vessel, fiber coils versus the larger ruby standard on the right, five to 2.7. Uh, so that's number of coils. This is total coil length implanted. This evens out a bit, as you might expect. And bolt soft and concerto about the same. And bolt soft versus ruby a little less. And there is a big discrepancy. Uh, ruby standard versus in full fiber required a lot less length of coil to achieve occlusion. And here's procedure time. As you would expect, because we were using less coils, the procedure time dropped precipitously in each group, about 10 minutes in every group. And that goes along with procedure time and fluoro time and obviously fluoro usage. So uh, that's uh, important data, you know, in the real world when we're doing these cases. And interestingly, I threw this in. This is packing density. We looked at this. This is the embold fiber versus ruby standard. What you see here is the packing density is much, much higher on the ruby standard, as anybody who's used to these coils might expect. They pack really nicely. But we found this didn't translate to faster occlusion times. It was dense, but contrast to blue right through it. Whereas the bold uh, pack a little less dense, but achieved it, achieved it losing them faster. So all in all, this came down to 57% uh, decrease in the number of coils required to achieve a fusion concerto versus in bold soft. Ruby soft versus in bold soft, kind of similar, 65% decrease and 45% ruby standard versus a bold fiber. Ooh. And why is this? This is total theory, but the wine design of the Embold is a little different. Uh, it's as much metal as you can get into a coil um, while maintaining a bit of availability to go in any type of microcatheter. As you see here, the penumbra and soft and, and packing have more metal, but you need a high flow catheter for that to go through. Another difference potentially accounting for this is the design of the filament inside the coil. Uh, there's a 24 filament braid in the uh, Embold coil, which is a single monofilament in the concerto and an eighth filament polymer in the penumbra, as you see zoomed in there. And previously in the past, we've uh, known this seems to correlate with faster occlusion times. So that's, that's the data. They asked me to throw in a couple cases where I used the Ruby, or a uh, Ruby cut, the Embol uh, coil. So I threw in a couple cases. I have three cases here. The first one's a Carto. If you haven't had a chance to use the coils. A part two is a great opportunity to pour in a ton of coils because it's uh, usually a large vessel. Uh, this is a 50-year-old admitted with a hemoglobin drop, had an upper GI bleed, usual story, uh, was scoped, didn't have esophageal varices or had really small esophageal varices, but have, of course, had large bleeding uh, gastric varices. And they were unsuccessful in stopping the bleed. And like always, they consult you for tips uh, rather than anything else. So there was a CT, we got it, and as you can see there, on the uh, bright side of the screen, uh, my pointer doesn't show up, but that's okay, uh, there's a large splenorenal shunt there. You can see it better on the coronal. Uh, the red arrows there point at the splenorenal shunt, which correlate to the gastrorenal sh or, uh, splenorenal shunt noted on the right um, in the green there. Uh, so it's an ideal case for a, a Berto, a Carto, you know, you could do this case any number of ways. You could use a clog, you could use an occlusion balloon with sclerosin. This particular case, I used coils uh, with gel foam. Uh, if the anatomy is difficult, this tends to be the easiest way of doing it. If the shunt is way out the renal vein and you're having trouble making the curve or getting a guide catheter up there, using coils is generally easy because all you have to do is uh, track in a microcatheter. So this picture actually shows us from an internal jugular approach with a directional uh, parent catheter sheet uh, and we snuck two microcatheters into the shun one distally one proximally through the proximal one deployed I believe eight in bold coils ranging in size from 10 to 22 millimeters and through the distal microcatheter started pumping in the gel foam once they had occlusion as you can see the image there uh, we have occlusion after the eight coils which actually isn't a lot of coils for these sometimes it could take a ton uh, so this worked really well in this particular instance and we kept pumping in the gel foam until we got occlusion. And we kept our eye out where you're looking for is 
the uh, appearance of the vessel leading to the splenic vein. As you see there, the red arrow corresponding to how it looks on CT. And uh, this case went really well. The patient did well, actually got follow-up imaging, which most of these don't get, and showed complete obliteration of the uh, varices on imaging. So it's a good use to use a lot of coils, use the bigger sizes. It's a fairly forgiving area, so you can um, uh, pretty much go to town. And we didn't have the packing foils at this time. They're newer, uh, but this would have been a great opportunity to use a really long length packing foil to really get in, fill that area up. Second case is kind of cool. I like this one. 80-year-old uh, renal cell cancer, rectal cell rectal cancer, and a pancreatic head mass. Uh, had an indwelling biliary drain for a long time, years. Uh, patient presented to the hospital, found to be anemic, and was complaining of a lump uh, near the side of his biliary drain. And one of the physical exam findings said the lump was pul pul pulsatile. Uh, so they got an ultrasound. The ultrasound is to the left there. Showed a hematoma but did comment that there was some flow in the uh, hematoma, so they ordered a CT. Uh, the CT from 2022 is on the left as it scrolls through. If you look into the anterior uh, abdomen there, there's a large, giant pseudoaneurysm, a lot of it filling with contrast, a lot of it not. It's self-thrombosed. And if you look back to the scan from 2018, the pseudoaneurysm was there and completely filled with contrast. It was not commented on by the radiologist. They probably thought it was a bowel loop and just completely ignored it. And so this patient's been walking around with this thing for four years at least, probably a lot longer than that. So we were asked to embolize it. On imaging, it looked like it was coming from the splenic, maybe some gastric uh, branches as well, but it looked extremely tortuous on the CT. So for this case, we actually started with a true select because... Uh, that is my most trackable microcatheter at my institution. Uh, so uh, the run there on the left is the celiac. As you see, there's a giant branch coming from the splenic and just dumping into this massive pseudoaneurysm. Uh, the selective splenic run just confirms this. So we got up there with a C2 and then eventually with a microcatheter and started get as close as we could to the pseudo and started deploying coils. The first one didn't deploy great because I was uh, a bit of a cowboy and picked too large of a size. And uh, eventually we got a hold of it and uh, packed them in really nicely and was able to shut this down with just a few coils. We used uh, a six, two fives, and a four, which was probably overkill, but it shut down. Um, that was not the end of the case. The aneurysm was still filling at this point from the gastric branches that we suspected looking at the CT. Um, these aren't the greatest runs, but there's these many tortuous branches coming from the left gastric artery all feeding this aneurysm to a lesser degree than the splenic, but still feeding it. So we actually got individually into these branches, put coils in some, but actually had to use glue for the other ones because it turned into a complete spider web. And this patient, uh, we were able to occlude it. They did really well. No ischemia. Aneurysm stopped filling. They got imaging as a post and they did fine. So that was another good indication. Final case, really quick, every uh, uh, coil talk has to have a pulmonary AVM. This is a 78-year-old female. She had multiple AVMs, probably had HHT, undiagnosed, uh, was constantly coming in with hypoxia, had embolized uh, AVMs in the past. This was when we just got the embolts, uh, so this was a bit ago now, but thought it was a great case to see how they worked. Uh, so here's the CT to the left, showing left lower lobe. There's a... Um, Pretty sizable AVM there. Not giant, but big enough, big enough to embolize, especially since she's symptomatic. And as you see, the run on the right there shows the filling of the AVM in the right, uh, or in the left lower low. Sometimes you get lucky with these and you fall right into the right branch. Other times, because of overlapping branch, I feel like I'm hunting around forever. This wasn't the worst one. We got pretty much right into it. Able to get into it with the uh, microcatheter through the parent and filled the nidus up with the coils. I actually have a shot of the coil going in in this case, and that's the embolt. These are still the fiber coils. This was early on. This is when they first came out, and you just see it kind of disappearing into that coil pack, creating a nice dense coil pack. And we did that with two, four, four coils a lot. So another pretty good result, easy to use. Patient was weaned off O2, did a six-minute walk test, was doing well, I just discharged. So that's... A quick rundown of the embolt coils. Um, they're not perfect. There is no perfect coil. It's not a thing, uh, but it is currently my favorite go-to coil. And we do keep a number of coils on the shelf at my institution. I find the fibers do help. 
in the standard coils and they do pack as well as a non-fiber foil. If you've used interlocks in the past, it's really a completely different experience to playing this coil versus the old interlocks. They do pack tight and perform really well.